I'm here with John Fetterman, who's mayor of Braddock, Pennsylvania, running for lieutenant governor in Pennsylvania. Uh, interesting dynamics in uh, Pennsylvania politics. In incredibly interesting dynamics. Last night, uh, um, President Trump was in my home state as I was literally, you know, taking the stage here. I mean, and, uh, you know, we are proud to be uh, the, the never-ending pushback against that kind of, uh, uh, that kind of politics here. When you're mayor of a place like Braddock, what are like the primary issues? Is it more political or is it more administrative? It's everything. Uh, you know, the community has uh, had lost 90% of its population. And when, when that occurs, you lose 90% of everything that makes uh, a community a community. And, and uh, particularly here in New Orleans, it's, it's much like the Ninth Ward, demographically, socioeconomically. And it's facing all those kind of challenges. It is uh, overwhelmingly African American, overwhelmingly um, one of a, a, a truly marginalized and, and uh, forgotten place. And things like opening playgrounds, things like you know bringing a, a restaurant to the town, things like public safety, they all uh, take precedence because it, there's just so much that has fallen away. How does your platform differ running for lieutenant governor than what the primary issues are in running for mayor of a place like Braddock? Well, I, I, I think that they're all the, they're all uh, connected. And uh, last night, I, I said the same things that I would have said to an audience in a very red county in Pennsylvania. I pride myself on not, you know, changing my views or, or saying different things based on the audience or where I'm at in Pennsylvania. And, it's because the, I think there are certain fundamental immutable truths uh, that uh, and policies and, and beliefs that are part of our, po uh, our party. And I think they're universal and I think they appeal uh, across, uh, across party lines. And uh, What would be one of those? I mean, what's, one, what's an issue that is very politicized and there's an understanding that the, the views really differ across party lines, but in reality, when you get down to it, people's values are pretty similar. I, I think uh, the one defining in the, the race in uh, now is unions and the, the right to organize. Um, you have our, our, um, the man running for governor literally wants to dismantle all of that. And it's already a challenged environment with Janice coming down from the Supreme Court. But, um, and you, know, you meet with the membership after, you know, one after another, and it's like, look, you may not agree with me on everything politically, but, but you, uh, I hope you understand that we want to protect the union way of life, which is, is dramatically under siege in Pennsylvania. And, and it's, it's about your way of life and safeguarding that. And I think we can find, and there is more commonality there than, than people are willing to realize. And, and I think a part of that was affirmed uh, during Connor Lamb's race. Uh, which is our backyard uh, in western Pennsylvania. And it, it, it resonates because it's economic security. It's not fixated on one particular issue that Fox News is trying to gin up that week. It's, it's really just your way of life. I'm hearing from people I'm, I've been interviewing here, but also at the national level, that the presence of Donald Trump has sort of thrown the Republican Party into a type of chaos. Big picture, Republicans support Trump, but the ones that don't are kind of split about what the strategy would be. There's some who say, let's actually vote for Democrats in the fall. There's others who say this is the time to, to start building third party, so on and so forth. In a race like yours in Pennsylvania, does that dynamic affect the voters that you're talking to and how they might vote? Every, everything affects the dynamic because I, I am very firmly of the philosophy, every county and every vote matters. Um, and uh, in 2016, I was uh, a surrogate for, for Secretary Clinton in Western Pennsylvania, and I was emphatic. I was begging people, we need your vote. You can't sit this one out. Uh, if you are on, if you're thinking third party, you're thinking, uh, I'm going to sit this one out. I'm thinking whatever. Um, you know, uh, uh, go for your candidate 150% in the primary. Go for the winner in the general. 250 percent because it's imperative that we vote for the best candidate in the general election and we not not uh, lament the fact that it's not our perfect candidate or, or our first choice necessarily and that's how we helped end it up with donald trump so in in this race in pennsylvania um you know our outreach to every voter uh regardless of who they may have voted for in 2016 
you know, I think it's critical. Healthcare in Pennsylvania, uh, manufacturing, a lot of different industries in Pennsylvania that are sort of uniquely impacted by the healthcare system that we have in this country. As Lieutenant Governor, what can you actually do to change the status quo around healthcare in Pennsylvania? Well, I, I think the most, the most of that is, is around continuing to advance the conversation that, that Medicare for all is not some far out crazy uh, pipe dream. It's this idea that, you know, we all deserve health care. It's a basic fundamental human right. And, and um, it doesn't work for everybody in Pennsylvania and, and constantly changing that conversation. Um, and that's really uh, remarkable. Every time you see a new poll out on how, how people are coming around on it, it went from, wow, that's a crazy idea, to now it's, it's, it's a majority of people now uh, across the line agree with that. So, um, and, and from my role as, uh, as the Lieutenant Governor, I think continuing to advance that is, is one of the important things that I will be proud to champion and advocate for. Can you move it forward significantly at the state level only without having a sort of big change in direction at the federal level? So for oh, example, absolutely. Yeah. Bernie Sanders' proposal looked to use something like a 2.2% uh, tax on the employ employee income and somewhere around 7% on employers in order to fund it. And then of course there would be sort of a shift in, in government spending on that as well. If you don't get that, what can the state do to push well, that forward? You know, I, I, think the, I think the fundamental thing to, to remember if in, in this upcoming election is this is what we're for. This is what we're, we're, we're going to eventually fight for. What this looks like at the federal level, who knows. But in, in Pennsylvania, this idea that something like, like Medicare for all isn't popular or is something that we wouldn't embrace is, is just fundamentally not true. We, um, I, I, you know, we understand that, that health care is, is, a, is a right. Tariffs. Um, when I spoke yesterday uh, to J.D. Scholten, who's running in Iowa, massive impact on farmers there as a result of what's going on with the tariffs. Same thing. Manufacturing, in, uh, yeah. a little bit of a different dynamic than farming, but still very impacted yeah. by tariffs. Talk a little bit about industries that are being and, hit by And that. an odd coincidence, both my running mate and my opposing running, uh, Scott Wagner, is we're all from York County, and York County is home to Harley-Davidson. And they've been dramatically impacted by Trump's, you know, roulette game of who gets a tariff, who gets a trade war now. And that's devastating. And, and uh, Harley Davidson's is as American as you can get and as Pennsylvania as you can get. And, and uh, it's indefensible. Donald Trump uh, claimed that U.S. Steel was opening six steel mills and they're not opening any. In fact, they're, the last steel mill in Western PA is in my community. Um, and you have the leader of the free world openly lying about things and endorsing uh, Scott Wagner, who's running for governor. And they, they have no idea what they're talking about. And they're using communities like mine as a prop and trying to fabricate a completely synthetic narrative that they're for manufacturing when actually their policies are, are undermining it even further with this, the, these kind of trade wars and a complete lack of awareness of the, the, the um, unintended consequences in like what are happening with Harley Davidson. Um, one of the sort of tactics that we've seen, I don't want to call it a policy because it's really not a policy, that we've seen from the Trump administration is you have a business environment that would lead a company like Carrier, for example, to say we're going to get, we're going to move a thousand jobs out of the country. And then Trump comes in and says, here's some money so that you stay. Now that's not policy, right? Like that doesn't change the underlying uh, business environment, but that is something that at the state level can be done, which is here's how a company is being affected by federal policy and the business environment. We can give them some money in order to get them to change what they're doing in the short term. Is that something that you would be open to or is that concerning because it's just not really policy, it's, it's sort of a half step short of a bribe? Well, I, I, I wouldn't, I, you know, there, there, are certain, there are certain industries in Pennsylvania, there are certain things that I, I, I believe uh, are, are worth uh, are worth supporting, and I, I wouldn't necessarily label it a, a, a bribe. I, I I think there's always going to be tax incentives and economic incentives, and I, I look at my own community, for example. Um, uh, typically, businesses, typically 
um, small businesses aren't going to say, I, my community isn't going to be the first choice that they're going to look at. So incentivizing some businesses and incentivizing some economic development in places is necessary. And it's not something that I would consider uh, in the pejorative. I would say that that's the role of government is to take the, the sharp edges off of, of, of a market capitalist system that um, to allow those kind of things to re return to an area that lost so much. Yeah, I don't disagree. I guess my, my concern is it's not scalable as policy, right? That's the issue, where well, if you go and you give carriers some money and they stay, even if it's in, in, in the short or medium term, you can't actually do that with all businesses, and therefore it is a sort of picking not, and choosing. Not all businesses, but, uh, but, uh, but what, I, what, I, what I can say is, is that um, it has to be and should be on a community basis, on an industry basis, and, and what's the final objective. And what I do find, what I find so distasteful is if, if it's done in a cynical way where we'll prop this up knowing six months later there's going to be a collapse and using the workers, the factory, or the town as a prop the way Donald Trump has, has done and uh, uh, using people as, as a prop is, is just, it's, it's reprehensible. One of the sort of stories about the 2016 election was that there was sort of a lack of understanding in urban areas of sort of the day-to-day -day that's impacting people in rural areas. Mm -hmm. Pennsylvania is a state that has very urban areas, large cities, but also there's parts of Pennsylvania a lot of people may, may not be aware that are extraordinarily rural. Yeah. What do you think is different in the rural areas that people in cities aren't understanding about why people end up voting the way they do? I, I just think that in, in, our, in our society now, we're never more in our own bubble. I'm in a bubble, you're in a bubble, and it's, it's, it's much more pronounced now. Your social media feed has been, been curated by, by you to some extent. The websites that you read. Um, and, and folks, I would just, I, I want to remind everybody is that they're not coming at it through your lens. You know, uh, people in a small community in rural Pennsylvania necessarily aren't reading, you know, Ezra Klein's latest hot take on a particular topic, for example. Um, and, and they just look at things in, in, in a different way. That doesn't make them bad. That doesn't make them somehow inherently racist or judgmental or anything. You know, I used the example of Luzerne County in my talk last night here at Netroots. Luzerne, Luzerne went 10 points for Obama in 2008 over a, a decorated war hero like John McCain. Five points over Mitt Romney in 2012. Donald Trump won that county by 20 points in 2016. You know, it, it's like it, it, message is important and just actually getting out in these places. I, you know, I've gone to counties that are red. They're always gonna be red uh, for the foreseeable future. And people are like, why would you go there? You're not wasting your time going to these counties because every vote matters and we want to bring as many people into the conversation as we possibly can and and uh, from a moral perspective as well as from a strategic one i'm curious about the dynamics of social issues in your race for lieutenant governor uh, there's sometimes you know i hate to call it conventional wisdom because often it's not it's not really that wise but the idea that in a lot of parts of the country races have moved beyond social issues because mm -hmm. everybody just sort of knows where they are we yep. know which voters value the issue of abortion over economic policy and which ones don't what's the dynamic of, of those social issues in, in pennsylvania well i mean I, I just approach it from there are things that i'm unwilling to compromise on like say for example marriage equality um, I, I was the first state official to solemnize a same-sex wedding in PA when it was still illegal in 2013. And, and if, if you voting for me is predicated on me saying that, that uh, LGBTQ people deserve second-class citizenship or they deserve, uh, then I'm like, hey, then don't vote for me. And if I know I can't win as a result, then it's not my time. Um, and there, there are just fundamental things I'm unwilling to compromise on that. And, and, and I think it, to some extent, maybe they don't agree with me there, but there'll, re, there'll be a, a level of respect. It's like, well, at least he's, he's being upfront. And, and that message is resonating with people. It's like, would you want the government to tell you who you can love? No. Well, then why would you want that for anybody else? And, and, uh, and, and, uh, and my wife is, uh, uh, is a former dreamer from immigration. And when people meet her, they're like, wow, maybe... Maybe I got this wrong. I mean, like, so, like, I, there, there's no issue like that that I would back for, off from. It's just, I, like, this is what I believe. And, and, um, and that's how I've always campaigned. And, and it's never been a, a, a serious impediment. And even if it is, then it's something that I'm not going to, I'm not willing to change. 
John Fetterman is running for lieutenant governor in Pennsylvania, currently the mayor of Braddock, Pennsylvania. Really great to meet you. And appreciate oh, hey, you taking thanks time. for having me on. Thank you.